on. Hi, so welcome this afternoon. This is going to be the episode two of the GNT sessions. This is Andrew Turner recording live from London. And today's session is with Mr. Bruce Johnston. Welcome, Bruce. Hi, Andrew. Thanks for having me on. So Bruce is the co-founder and chief commercial officer of a very interesting company that I've been speaking to for quite a while. And um, it's, an interesting, it's an interesting proposition they've got. And I'm going to hand it over to, to Bruce to kind of explain what the company is and what he's been doing, what keeps him up at night. Um, and uh, maybe over to Bruce, you can just explain a bit about what you're doing, what you're working on, what's your background, what's your introduction. Uh, okay, well, first of all, thanks for having me on the podcast, Andrew. Um, we are actually coming up for our second anniversary. Fable will be two years old next year. Wow. Yeah. Um, and we founded this company two years ago to be a, a dedicated uh, creative agency for the technology sector. So okay. we wanted to start a company that would be able to provide uh, design, branding, and marketing materials for technology. Um, specifically for technology mm -hmm. and uh, we had a, a combination of founding partners that had the right mix of skills and experience to to make this um, a, a viable proposition and we saw a gap in the market for this because we we know that there are a lot of tech companies out there that um, struggle to explain their products and their services right and, uh, it was on that basis that we decided to found the company and what, 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 so why, why, what, what did you see, you know, you, it sounds like you, you saw, you saw a problem a few yeah, years ago. What, sure. what were the so, kind of, could you give us some examples of what you saw with founders you were working with or tech companies you were working with? So we have five founding partners and three of the five are computer scientists. And that's okay. super unusual for a design agency. Yeah. So, 60% of the founding partners in this design company are computer scientists. <laughs> and it, was, it was these guys that identified the problem. And these guys were partners in another company that was uh, providing software development consultancy, specifically right. in uh, the world of continuous delivery and DevOps. Mm -hmm. And they grew to the point where they had they'd exhausted their immediate networks in terms of being able to grow. And they realized that the only way they were going to keep growing was to get their, their marketing and their message on point. But they also realized that they did not know how to do this themselves. Okay. They, they understood their, they knew that they had great products. They knew they had great services. They knew they had great people working in the company, but they did not know how to explain this to their market. Uh, luckily for them, they knew myself and um, our creative director, uh, Jonathan, and they decided we need, a, we need a dedicated creative team that can help us grow. And then from there, it was a really easy jump to say, okay, well, if we need this, then a bunch of other tech companies must also need this. Mm. So instead of hiring some creative people to work in-house, how about we start a creative agency to right. serve not just our own company, but the entire tech sector? Right. Uh, that was basically um, how Fable came mm. into existence. And you call it Fable, you said Fable. So what's, what's, the, what's the thinking behind the name? Is there some kind of story behind that? Yeah, for sure. So um, we believe that the, the most effective way of communicating is storytelling. So for as long as humans have been alive, the, the best way we have of telling each other things, of sharing information is by telling stories. Right. They're, they're entertaining. They're easy to remember. Mm -hmm. uh, people, once they hear them, repeat them to, their, to the, 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 those around them. Um, you know, it, it's, quite often it's the way we, we educate children. You know, we, you want to teach like some really easy moral lesson, you wrap it up in a story, you wrap it up in a fable. Right. Um, and that's, that's how the, the name of the company... It's like the Hans Christian Andersen kind of, uh, of creative, creative agency. Yeah, or, or, like, uh, or like Aesop or whatever, you know. Right. You, know, you, can, you can take a, 
take just a, a small kernel of truth and then uh, tell it in a, a simple, straightforward, memorable, entertaining way. Because I suppose the thing is that tech is, is so, is so, you know, is, well, I suppose it depends what your background is, it's quite complex, yeah? Mm. So actually, you know, what I found, I don't know if you found as well, to try and distill something that's complex to be simple is, is definitely a skill and an art. Um, and you can't, you know, it takes a bit of time to do that. So that demystifying of, of complex, complex items, complex topics into something that you can communicate to the masses yeah. Is, is, is that your kind of secret source? Is that your kind of essence? <clears throat> That's the, the challenge. That is the, 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 the thing that is, that challenges us every day. How do you take something that's, uh, that's really quite abstract, that's highly technical, and how do you take that and explain it in a way that's easy to grasp for the majority of people? Um, quite often, this in a practical sense for us, this means explaining uh, difficult concepts in tech to C-levels and, and managers speak to, right. to try and uh, demonstrate a business case. Um, and they don't, they don't always have that, you know, to your point you said about your founders or your, some of your founding partners that they, if they've come through a computer science background, then some of that stuff that they will, they will know will just be you know, kind of straightforward for them. Whereas for, you know, most C-level execs or people in senior positions these days, they, they're aware that they need to actually be aware of technology, but they don't necessarily have the background or the backdrop and they need to be educated on it as well. Don't they? So in, it's quite a journey for, to, to kind of work out how you do that. Yeah. And quite often these are people who are time poor and they want to know, really quickly really easily okay what does this thing do why do i need it how is it going to save me money you right know? and you to be able to answer those questions uh simply concisely in a straightforward way uh, is quite a challenge and quite often what we find is we have uh, software engineers and companies who see the value in all sorts of tech Mm. And what they need us for is to explain it to their managers. Right. So they say, look, if, if, if only we could convince the guy who is in charge of the budget. That <laughs> then it would make our lives enormously easier. Um, so that, that's something that we, we see quite a lot is, um, is, is people within companies who, who need us to come in and explain it to their managers. And what, what I mean, what do you, th so what, you know, the, the, the kind of your background, your, you know, this whole, this, you know, we talk about GNT, we talk about growth and technology. Okay. So I think you explained that the, the essence of, of why Fable was created was because you, you had that, this relationship with these, these kind of tech, tech guys really who, you know, had that kind of the vision to see that there was a problem in their growth strategy, yeah? yeah. And they needed to change the way they presented themselves to the world and, and invest in brand, yeah? So, so it became, became a, a kind of a, a, a snowball effect with their, they became known for more than just being technically competent. They became known as a reputation for delivering excellent customer engagements, innovation, all those kind of good things that associate with the brand. But, I mean, you personally, so, how did you get involved in the tech stuff? Is is a did you just fall into it, or you know what's 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 your story around getting involved in tech? Or have you have you not really had a tech background at all? It's just something that's evolved since you've been involved with these guys. Uh, my, uh, I'm a, a, a late comer to technology, definitely. Uh, my, but you're still young, so it's okay. <laughs> not as young as you might think. <laughs> my my, uh, my own trajectory is really quite unusual. Uh, I came to technology quite late. I was uh, growing up and on at university, I was always a, a bookworm. I was much more interested in the past and the future. I was... Um, Are you a history graduate or something? Uh, no, uh, English literature. Okay. All right. Okay. Yeah, one of those. Um, but I was also fascinated in, uh, in history as well. Um, politics, philosophy, um, all the stuff that's really interesting, but doesn't make you especially employable. 
<laughs> so I, I was I was always fascinated um, in that direction, and my my initial uh, career choice was to become uh, an academic. I wanted to okay. be a, I wanted to be a lecturer in English, and I pursued that to uh, the point where I had a really difficult decision to make. About ten years ago, I was offered uh, some funding for a PhD. Right. Um, but it wasn't really enough money and it felt like it felt like a lot more debt and a lot more risk for a career path that even then didn't seem particularly well defined so um i decided yeah, I, could have, I could have called you dr johnson then today i could have introduced or, you or yeah or i could oh, have that would have been the upside being a professor by now yeah but uh oh. uh so I, I turned my back on academia and decided to um bear in mind this is early 2008 right so i've decided at this point that i'm going to try and um make a career in pr or advertising or or something like that um and then about a month after i handed my master's thesis uh, the banking system collapses yeah exactly yeah i remember that and yeah. the labor market is uh pretty awful pretty dreadful right. Um, I went to London to uh, basically knock on doors, uh, try and uh, get into uh, the industries that way without much success. I, I picked up some, some work here and there, uh, but the message I got in London 10 years ago was even for seasoned professionals, professional copywriters, uh, work was thin on the ground 10 years ago. Hmm. Um, so I did what a lot of people from my part of the world do which is uh, take a job in the oil industry okay. so i went to that, work in oil. what because of the scottish heritage or something or is it yeah well uh we we've got a huge uh, oil industry um, <laughs> on the doorstep yeah, yeah based in, in aberdeen so um i went to work in a uh, data management for oil for right. five years um which gave me a whole new perspective on uh what it's like well, to work that, in well, it's quite, that's quite typical now isn't it because i was i was just at a session today and the classic phrase was data is the new oil so there you go you've actually got your own strap line there if you think about it <laughs> yeah uh this was a uh, it was a complete departure from uh from what i've been doing before uh, managing uh data migration projects and uh developing best practices for for data yeah and, uh, it was for the most part it was dreadfully boring, but I did learn a few things. Um, so do you do you learn the language on the back of that? Then you think is that is that that helps with the tech language? Because if you you come from that kind of English literature kind of academic background, then I mean what I found in the last twenty years is that the whole language piece around tech is it's you know this buzzword, this buzzword, this buzzword, this buzzword. A lot of the fundamentals don't change. Yeah. Um, but actually it's all the language that changes. So I don't know if you found challenges around that, just trying to get your head around that. I, I mean, I struggle today even, and I've been in 20 odd years. It's just like suddenly this new buzzword come out and they go, what's that? And they go, it's this. Oh, okay. Well, one thing, one thing my education did do was, uh, it, it taught me the value of critical thinking. And it also, uh, it also gave me a really, really sharp bullshit filter. <laughs> okay and uh as soon as i i joined the corporate world and this was a, a big wow. oil company um mm. i just saw corporate management jargon everywhere and right. um a lot of people use it as a as a sort of shield you know mm. as a as a as mask. oil yeah yeah, yeah yeah there's a lot of people pretending by mm. you know they, they they circulate the same words uh, and these words go in and out of fashion. I've noticed recently that leverage is the, that is, seems to be the hot word at the moment. Everybody's leveraging everything right now. Well, I suppose, yeah, I suppose you see it even more often now with, with all these tech companies trying to raise the head above the, like the meerkat, they're trying to raise the head above the, a very busy fragmented market. And, 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 and what I find, I don't know if you find the same thing, is that they, they want to draw pictures, yeah? They want to have a graphic view of it. But then also the, the biggest thing is, it's the actual the message hierarchy it's like what are the words that that can create an emotion 
or create a, create a, a kind of relationship with that that prospect, that customer, and mm-hmm. kind of you know that you know you know the words create the pictures in their mind. I don't know if you that's the kind of thing you, you do with the fable approach is that a hack because I, I think that's if you can capture that then you can really start to capture people's imagination and, uh, yeah, and I think that's true but uh, language is also used incredibly cynically um, I know right. this year uh, there were uh, examples of companies listed on uh, the US stock exchange just adding the name blockchain to their uh, mm to their the, the company name in order to attract investment and, and boost their share price. Yeah, yeah. So there's a lot of bandwagon jumpers um, when it comes mm. to that whole thing, but. It's, it's like the lemming approach, isn't it? I suppose a bit of that in every, in every industry that you, you, you work in. Mm. So, so, I mean, so, so it sounds like that you kind of, you, 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 it wasn't planned, it emerged the kind of the exposure to tech. And then, obviously, as part of your a part of your growth strategy with Fable, then you've you've identified that there's been because of your co-founders in Fable, they had a business problem, and then you're seeing not only helping those guys scale their company globally, which is I know is what you're working on, yeah. but then also other tech startups that you're starting to do work for, and obviously some quite. I mean, I know you've been doing some work with some very famous Silicon Valley based companies as well, which is pretty impressive, and actually, you know, delivering some really innovative. Uh, brand development work for them, who I would consider as pretty well developed brands. Mm. But it just shows, I think, you're actually onto something with the stuff you've been doing. It's really quite interesting to see that output and that 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 that, um, that work you've done. I suppose on your personal side, I mean, you know, this, we talked about the T. If you talk about the G, you know, your personal story. I mean, any any you know, I think in anybody's anybody's uh, career, you know, it's not always kind of peaks. There's also troughs. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, you know, thinking about the kind of the, the audience that are going to listen to this podcast is, um about, you know, the, their tech founders, their co-founders, their leadership teams, their CEOs, what, what are the kind of, um, what are the kind of peaks and trough uh, stories that you could share today that would, would help them or inspire them to, to think about as they, they go on there or they write their own growth story. What, what have you, what have you experienced that you can share that you, you think would be useful? Uh, well, when the when the banking crisis hit in 2008, and I was looking to try and start my career, uh, that was a, a really deep trough. That was um, that was a hole that I never thought I'd get out of. Um, those those were really difficult times. Uh, trying to to just even just to to find an opportunity was really really difficult. Um, what I've learned. Uh, since then and like my professional life is uh, never celebrate the wins like too uh, don't be too enthusiastic about the wins but don't be too down about the setbacks either right try and try and maintain a sort of uh, emotional equilibrium um, always try so, to, so you're not saying you're not saying don't celebrate success but you're saying don't get carried away it's, it's, exactly. don't so, have extreme highs and extreme lows is that what you kind of yeah, say for sure and if you're in a startup but i think that's especially true if you're in a startup because uh you will experience highs and lows um, when you right. when you get a new customer or an exciting new customer that, that's a really big high yeah um but you can the smallest thing can can set you back when you're a small company, so you have to be able to um, deal with drawbacks, <clears throat> and you know you, you have to be prepared to, to take it on the chin every so often. So it's being resilient. Is it being resilient? Is that is that kind of a learning as well? Yeah, for, for sure. Uh, just trying to to, to maintain a, an equilibrium in, in good times and bad. Yeah. And what um. I mean, if if you were if you if your if your younger self was sat in front of you today in this session, what what would you what kind of words of advice would you give him? Is there anything else that you th- think that would be something that you would uh, you would share with your Buy younger Bitcoin. self? Huh? Buy Bitcoin. Buy Bitcoin. Okay. <laughs> it's a bit late, then. Yeah. This is um, this is something I've been asked before, and it's something I've asked myself quite a few times. Mm-hmm. Um, I really value the education 
that I received at university. Right. Uh, I think it taught me some really, really valuable skills. And I'm really reluctant to say that I would be the person I am today without it. However, on balance, if I, if I was to say start university from scratch, if you were to put me in a time machine back 20 years, yeah. I'd probably study computer science rather. Oh, really? Than, wow. Yeah, I would probably, um, if, I was, if I was given the time again, I'd probably be a computer scientist rather than um, have, have gone off to study English literature. I think that a lot, of the, a lot of the intellectual itches that I needed to scratch in English, I could have done in computer science. Right. Um, the abstract problem solving, um, it, it, it's, it, it's a question of looking at problems and instead of trying to articulate a solution with words, you're articulating a solution with code, right? Mm. So, I, I, I'd be very, very tempted if given the opportunity again to um, have been a computer scientist. I, mean, I didn't expect you to say that. I mean, I, I think, I mean, my, my, dis, my bills on that as the disruptive comment would be, would you go to university? Uh, yeah, for sure. Um, I, I, I would, definitely. Because um, there, is, there, is there, there is a train, a train of thought and some, some other people that, are going to be future guests on on this podcast that you know that I know are coming up that are, have got a very very uh, strong opinion about um, even the education system um, globally, um, and also about how obviously there's a gold rush of people who want to be involved in tech these days because it's now so so cool, mm. um, it's ice cool even um, when you know when I started in it it wasn't viewed as that at all but. Um, the interesting thing is, is that, you know, with, with, with the internet and with obviously a number of the tech titans helping people to uh, create capabilities where you can self-educate, it does, it does raise interesting questions around that, around that university piece. But I know, it's, you know, maybe something for a future, future episode that I can talk about with, the, with some of the guys in the, in the network that we're going to have on this episode, you know, different episodes. Um, I suppose that the one question I suppose I would also ask you is, is about... Um, your dreams for fable you know what's what what you know you, you said you you're kind of a toddler you know kind of you know you just find your feet um what 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 does it what does it what does it look like in the next three to five years what what's your, what's what's your dream for fable what what does what does that look like uh our ambition is to be the the go-to creative agency for tech companies like we okay. want um we want major household names and technology to be in a position where when they have a new product or a new service, they say, okay, uh, what we really need uh, here is Fable to explain this. That's kind of where we're aiming. That's where we want to be. And there's that, there's that phrase, I think you coined that Fableize. You want to Fableize all these tech startups. Yeah, is that right? Yeah, yeah for sure. <laughs> you have to get that into the English dictionary. If you make it in the dictionary, it, it means you've probably made it. <laughs> Especially the Oxford one. Yeah. So I suppose in, in the in that in that kind of in your personal growth story, that you know the, the, the way if you got dreaming to be a you know a scale a scale agency, you know really a a create a, tech, a creative tech titan, you could call it. Yeah. If you think about you know Google the Agfa boys, as I call them, the Apple, Google, Facebook, Amazon. Uh, the four horsemen of the apocalypse, as Scott Galloway calls them. Mm. Um, you know, so it sounds like you, you've got ambitions to be, I don't know, the WPP or, you know, the WPP, maybe, maybe not Martin Sorrell, but the WPP of, um, of tech, uh, tech branding. Is that, is that, or is that, is that, a, is that a, not the kind of analogy you want to have? Create a new, a new definition of what a creative tech company should be. Um, that's a good question. Um, it, 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 it's a good question that how, how much are we like a traditional um, creative agency? Yeah. Uh, like the, the traditional sort of mad men type thing. Right. Uh, to what extent are we uh, a new animal because mm. of our, our, our tech associations? I think that what we're doing is something different. I feel like we're carving out um, a, a separate niche for ourselves. Right. You're creating a new pillar, a new a new motorway. Yeah, I think that it, it's a 
the, the creative agencies of the future will need to be like us, I think. Um, it, I think it's too, it's too much to say that we're pioneers because there are one or two others like us. Right. Um, but the, the space isn't that busy yet. But the whole point of starting this, uh, of starting Fable, was that it would be able to sell things that are, or explain things that are difficult to be explained. Yeah. Uh, there are a thousand agencies in London that can sell cornflakes, sunglasses, mm. like uh, soft that's drinks, that's whatever. That, that's easy, right? Everybody, everybody knows what cornflakes do. Yeah. Uh, nobody knows what, well, not many people know what a continuous delivery pipeline looks like mm. or why you should adopt uh, DevOps or why you should migrate your uh, software and processes to the cloud. Yeah, I mean, I mean it's quite interesting. I mean, I, I met a guy this lunchtime uh, who's going to hopefully come on the podcast in a few weeks, and he's the CTO of a, a London-based tech company, and they literally have built a device that goes into a retailer that, that looks at the, the faces of people as they leave the store and works out what's their emotional state using computer vision. Mm. I mean, how cool is that? I mean, how could you, you know, rather than pressing that button, I'm happy or I'm sad, literally yeah. to actually look at a bank of people walking out of store. Um, I mean, just the, you know, just the, the, the tech innovation, just, just that use case. It's just, you know, I, I mean, I've spent, you know, spent a number of years working at Tesco. I just couldn't, I mean, I just, I got the use case straight away. It's a big problem. Um, but actually using technology and computer vision to do that, it just, it just blows, it's mind blowing. Uh, one so, of the things that and the, but then how do you, it's to your point, is how do you communicate what that proposition is? How do you communicate what that value is? Um, how do you distill it down that the, 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 the economic buyer in that retailer would understand what it's about? Um, yeah. So I suppose, so, so what, what, one, of, one of the questions I got for you was about, you know, your that futurology, if you have that crystal ball and you were looking into the future with, you know, with now your your new set of lenses, your new set of sunglasses on 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 the tech space, what what do you see in the next you know five, ten, fifteen years? What 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 what's your? Do you see things that are good in the horizon, or do you are you concerned about the future? Or obviously, there's been quite a lot of press recently about a number of slightly challenging uh, tech for not so good, you could say, um, that have been highly publicised. What what's what's your what's your sense on that? Uh, overall, I'm uh, really optimistic about tech um, for the future. I think that the potential in technology is, um, it, it, it's almost difficult to, to understate what we could achieve even in our lifetimes. Um, yeah. we, could, we could, within our, within our lifetimes, we could solve global warming, we could mm -hmm. eliminate poverty, we yeah. could eradicate disease. We could, um, we may even conquer death. I think that'll happen this century. Whether it'll happen in time for us, I don't know. <laughs> so, yeah, so there's, there's, there are some enormous uh, achievements on the horizon, but I do have reservations about AI. I think it needs to be developed in a really responsible and careful way. Um, we'll only get one shot at it. Um, I can't remember who, who advocated for it, but uh, the best idea I heard for the development of AI was for a sort of international um, style Manhattan project where okay. all the global powers would be invested in it. Right. Uh, because well, yeah, we kind of governance on it. On, on yeah, what? for sure. Because if we make it, if, if we leave this, if this is, it becomes like, a, like the space race and it's um, like a race to the moon style scenario, Hmm. then the race to strong AI becomes a zero-sum game. And I think that would be really dangerous. And it would also encourage, I think, people to maybe pursue it in the sort of aggressive way that could lead to disaster without safety. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, mean, it's, it's, I mean, it's fascinating. I think if you, you know, it's when you start to see what's happening and the kind of the stuff that's in the press around, um, you know, we see certain people in the Valley, Silicon Valley talking about this stuff and, and then, you know, I think back to, you know, just watching the Terminator movies and you think about some of the stuff that came out of that, how it just realized how kind of the, the writers of the Terminator were, were actually a couple of decades ahead of their time 
in, in what they were predicting. And yet it's all starting to come true. I mean, it's just, it's quite, it's quite, it's quite mind blowing. Yeah. Uh, um, I, I can very easily see oh. a situation in the future where robots will be demanding the vote. Robots will be demanding the vote. <laughs> in franchisement for robots. Yeah, for sure. Right. That's like the cartoon, that. That's like that film, the robot in, film. In terms of, uh, in terms of the near future, um, like within five years, I think the, something that will be really visible in five years is uh, driverless vehicles, especially in big cities. Autonomous vehicles, yeah. yeah. Maybe not for private individuals, but um, I can see taxi companies, uh, pizza delivery, Amazon, Uber, Lyft, all of that. I think if your job... If your job is basically driving a vehicle from A to B, uh, I would start thinking about other career options. Reskilled, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because driving isn't just isn't going to be a thing anymore. <clears throat> yeah, whole new capabilities are kind of being redefined and re reshaped, aren't they? Completely. So, yeah, exactly. I agree. And even like going 10, 15 years from now, I think that automation will consume uh, an incredible amount of jobs. Even jobs that you might think would be safe from automation, I think are are in danger so we have a client um and they are working on uh an ai that will uh study legal cases right so um let's say you have a legal case the ai will will consume all the information on the on the case will look at the entire history of similar cases mm -hmm. and will be able to tell you to a percentage the likelihood of you winning in court. Wow. Now, so it's looking at all the precedent for all yeah. the case history. So right. imagine, imagine what that does for the legal profession. So, and, and imagine what it does for a really litigious society like America, for example. Yeah. So vexatious litigation would almost be eliminated. If someone sends you, um, if someone sues you, you can take, take whatever case they have, submit it to the AI, the AI comes back and says, this case is like a 3% chance of success. You, yeah. can, you can dismiss the suit and you've saved the fortune in legal fees. Yeah. Um, well, based, on, based on a personal story, which I won't share on this podcast, that I can completely uh, think that's a fantastic idea. <laughs> and we should all invest in it. Um, um, I think, and even again, within five years, I don't think it's, I don't think it's crazy to imagine Say, for example, you mentioned supermarkets. I don't think it's crazy to imagine a supermarket in five years that just doesn't have any human staff in it. Right. It's really automated. You know, um, you, can al you can already go in there and out there with your shopping without interacting with a human. Well, I don't, uh, if, I, you, I don't know if you know that, I mean, some of the, 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 the UK retailers and obviously US retailers, well, have already moved to that kind of model. Um, we, you know, at Tesco, we had uh staffless stores for tesco.com and things like that that was quite a few years ago but yeah and no, I, I agree it's this thing about what's value add what's non-value add what can you automate how can you get the machines to run run the business for you in, in you know in a controlled way but i think so our concepts like uh universal basic income that's a conversation that will have to happen i think within 10 years yeah uh, otherwise we will have many many millions of people with very little to do yeah uh, looking beyond that i think that crispers are really uh, fascinating technology um the genome editing technology okay uh crispr cas9 right uh that's been receiving a lot of um media attention over the past year or so uh that gives us the ability to edit genome um that's that's just incredible i mean yeah. that is that's the eradication of genetic disease right uh which would be extraordinary um okay and then beyond that mind upload how close are we to that who knows what's that sorry the what mind upload <laughs> right okay you've been watching too many sci-fi movies i think bruce black mirror maybe i don't know You've been doing these are some of your moonshots. You've been obviously watching some. You've been doing some too much Singularity University recently. I think too much. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. So yeah, in my personal yeah, my personal journey. Yeah, I I, uh, I encountered Raymond Kurzweil a long time ago. Oh, did you? Okay, he's a great guy. That's amazing. 
yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I think it was um, all the futurism stuff. Yeah. I got his book, The Singularity, is near. Yeah. Uh, maybe ten years ago, and yeah. that completely changed my perspective. All the stuff about the X Prize and the yeah, yeah well, fantastic because stuff around that. He was he he, he was describing uh, a world in the near future that seemed at once outlandish but also realistic at the same yeah, time. Exactly. And it seems really very, well, it's real, it's here today, isn't it? So, it does but, but, but just, yeah. just trying to, um, I suppose, to try and give something back to some of the audience we've got on this podcast, the, you know, the um, suggestions are advice. You know, if, if you, you know, if some founders, some co-founders sat on this, listening to this podcast in their cars, on the tube, on the train, you know, in their homes, um, what you know? What if they've got this fantastic idea? They want to build it. You know, they want to create a unicorn. You know, what what you know? You sat there in your in your in your role today as co-founder of Fable, and you you know you're working with lots of customers all the time. What what's the kind of what are the jewels? You know, what are the kind of the takeaways? What are the kind of thoughts that you would want to leave with them to think about? Um, you know, based on some of the stuff that you've seen over the last few years, and that what you're starting to do more strategically with your customers. Any anything you want to share on that? Well, if, if you have a great idea, um, the first thing you should do is uh, start to, to actually work on it and put some of it into uh, some sort of practical application. If you've got a great idea, find out how great it is. Go and test it. Do stuff with it. The worst thing you can do is procrastinate and yeah. try to... It, the, if you think that you can refine your idea in your head and then the implementation will be easy. That's a big trap. So the only way to find out how great your idea is, is to start doing things with the idea. Test it, get an MVP, yeah. put, it, put it in front of customers, um, share it with people, get some feedback, iterate. Um, it'll probably turn out if you do end up making something successful out of it, whatever that is, will probably be a significant departure from the original idea. Right. So you've got to kind of get out of the office, think about the pivot, think about get get real primary feedback from real customers that you've had. Yeah. Um, the other thing I would say is that, you, particularly if you're thinking about founding a startup, is um, it's really difficult to do it alone. Um, I would say that you need at least one other person probably two um and make sure you choose the right people to find your company with mm. um, bear in mind how much time you will be spending with your co-founders you will spend this, this this is back to that kind of that discussion we had the day about the beer mat concept you know the if you're in the pub and you had the beer mat and you had the idea in the middle and then who are the who are the three to four people that are going to cover off those corners of the beer mat is that, is that kind of what you're trying to think about? Yeah, so you need to choose the right people, not just for their skills, uh, but also for their, their character, their temperament. Yeah, um, their if, attitude. Yeah, yeah if, if there's any personal friction in the team, then that's probably not going to fly. Um, but sometimes you can only find that out by actually, you know, doing some kind of work with them or starting to, I suppose it's back to the MVP thing, isn't it? It's testing and learning and experiencing and being out of the office with them and working with them. Then you start to get, you start to either gel or you don't gel. Is that, is that what you found as well? Yeah, for sure. Um, a little tension can be good, but it's, <laughs> it, it can be good uh, because... Uh, a little conflict can sometimes, uh, a little friction can sometimes create things. Yeah. Um, but it, it's really important that you have healthy relationships with your with your co-founders, and be, because you you need to have a culture of honesty. Uh, yeah. Right from the start. Because you're gonna be spending a lot of time with them as well, aren't you? So I mean, you spend more time with your co-founders than you will with anybody else if, if you're yeah. serious. Uh, they will they will become your 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 brothers your <laughs> <laughs> well especially when you get the tattoos anyway yeah exactly yeah for yeah exactly yeah we we're gonna start doing that well you oh you oh really oh my god right okay I'll look forward to that yeah I'm not, I'm not gonna ask you whereabouts on your body the the fable <laughs> fable tattoo is gonna be yeah. but I'm I'm sure you'll tell me in the future well I'm sure we can do you one for free oh oh 
so it's generosity. So you've got a Yorkshireman and a Scottishman, you see, on this on this on this episode. So you know, it's kind of you know, what are they what are they renowned for? Exactly. The drinking, other thing I would drinking do lots of beer. The other thing I would add for co-founders and, and people that have got um, ideas that mm -hmm. they think are potential unicorns is think about how you're going to communicate your idea to the world. Yeah. Think about think about what people actually want. Um, it, it may well be that you've got the greatest product ever, but if you don't know how to communicate it, it's probably not going to fly. Yeah. So it's it, it quite often in in all sorts of industries, it's not the the best of breed that becomes the unicorn. Yes, exactly. Yes. Yeah. It's, the, it's the company that understands the market best, is able to communicate the ideas in the right way, um, has effective branding, tells good stories. Yeah. And there's a lot of there's a lot of historical examples of that. Um, you know, Microsoft versus Apple, but I think Apple have kind of caught back up again and overtake it at Microsoft. Well, maybe not on revenue, but on innovation and all that. Um, despite, I won't, I won't go into detail of that anyway. Not on this call. Um, okay, fantastic. So, uh, any any final thoughts before we 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 um, we draw close to today's episode? Any 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 final thoughts from yourself before we wrap this up? Um, the only the only final thoughts I would leave you with is that um, we're, in my opinion, we're on the verge of um, a really really bright future um, due to technology, and. It, it, it's an exciting time to be alive. I mean, it, it genuinely is. The, yeah. Well, I'm 36 years old. Um, you young man. Yeah. You're starting out. But when, when I, I, yeah, exactly. So I'm not that old. But when I started university, I remember um, we had a, a, an elementary course, an introduction to IT skills. Right. And you had a room full of 18 year olds and the lecturer was demonstrating Google to us. Mm -hmm. This is Google. This is a search engine. You, oh, wow. You use Google to search the internet. And the, the room was agog. People were taking notes. <laughs> right. Now, can you imagine this? Now, I mean, that was less than 20 years ago. Mm. Look where we've come in 20 years. Yeah. Um, I know. So imagine what the next 20 years looks like because i i think it's i think it's only reasonable to suggest that we'll see a lot more progress in the next 20 than we did in the last 20. yeah and well, see, the speed's well, picking up and the, the the rate of innovation is is you know i mean some stuff with amazon that i, I was i was with with today um just the rate of the rate the pace of change is accelerating and this is from this is from Werner Vogels, who's the CTO of Amazon. And you know, if you think about anybody that's close in close to the future of tech in the world, the guy that is the kind of right hand man of Jeff Bezos, um, and he even he said today um, that he he struggles to to keep pace with it. <laughs> and he's the CTO of Amazon.com. Yeah. So you know, fantastic kind of um, just shows how humble the guy is as well. Um, but also, he's, he he recognises that you know how fast this thing's happening, and it, and it's picking up speed. So um, yeah, it's, it's it's kind of hold on, hold on to the roller coaster ride, and let's uh, let's um, let's let's raise our arms like this. You know, it's like the it's like the kind of the Pepsi Max. I think uh, predicting the future is is a little bit of a mugs game. Um, there's there's some things we can predict with relative certainty, but. Um, one of the things I look forward to is seeing all the surprising ways that tech will evolve in the next, I guess, even just between now and 2030, uh, I yeah. think we'll see some pretty incredible things. Yeah. I think it's, it's quite likely we'll be on Mars by 2030. Wow. I'll hold you to that. <laughs> I, know, I, know you've got, I know you've got a call next with Jeff Bezos, so, you know, I bet, I bet we better close this. Uh, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll bet you a fable tattoo that will be on Mars. Oh, oh, oh right. I, I can't wait for that. <laughs> I'm not telling you where I'm going to put it. Um, so all I can say is thank you so, so much for coming on today's episode. Um, uh, episode two of the G&T sessions uh, and with our lovely guest, Mr. 
Bruce Johnston from Fable, the co-founder and chief commercial officer. And um, that's been the GNT session. That's been and the GNT session, sessions live from London uh, with Andrew Turner. And uh, keep, keep listening because we're going to be posting some more lovely uh, guests and lovely interesting talks and discussions around a bit of GNT. And in the future, uh, and hopefully Bruce might get invited to this as well, we might be even doing it in gin and gin distilleries in different places around the world, which would be an interesting twist of the GNT. Uh, not that GNT means about gin and tonic, it obviously means growth and technology, as we both know, as we all know. So that's been Andrew Turner and Bruce Johnson. Thanks, Bruce, for today. And uh, well, let's catch up soon. Take care. Thank you very much for having me on. No problem. Bye-bye.